Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Darylin and today I have for you plants that I will never own. So we've all seen the videos floating around on YouTube of plants I hate, plants that I didn't like until I saw them in person, plants that I will never buy, etc, etc. But the funny thing about a lot of these videos is that eventually the person comes around and ends up with some of the plants and then explains, well, I thought I didn't like it, but I changed my mind. Well, I thought a fun twist on this trend would be to find some plants that I can tell you 100% for sure, without a doubt, I will never own. Now, it's not because I don't like them. It's because it would be impossible, whether it's because they're too big, too rare, critically endangered, or have just insane growing and care requirements. These are the top plants that I can assure you I will never be able to keep in my collection. Now, despite the fact that all of the plants on this list are unfortunately forbidden friends, a lot of them are still extremely fascinating. So strap in plant nerds, because here are the top plants that I and also you will never own. All right, so starting off the list with a bang, we have the corpse flower, AKA Amorphophallus titanium. <laughs> Oh, gotta love Latin. Scientific names are so good. Amorphophallus titanium. Really? I'm just gonna let you guys think about what that uh, probably means. Anyway, the corpse flower is 100% a plant I will never own for obvious reasons. First and foremost, they get absolutely huge. I don't know about any of you, but I don't have space for any plant that's that large, let alone something that is known to reek of rotting, decaying, dead flesh. That's right, that's where the plant gets its name, the disgusting smell that is likened to that of a rotting corpse. Now, even if I did have space in my apartment now for a plant that size, there's absolutely no way that it would be doable to house something that could eventually smell like a rotting corpse in my place of residence where I have to inhabit constantly. Granted, I don't think it's particularly quick or easy to get the plant to mature to the point where it smells like a rotten corpse. However, I don't really want to play around with it because at the end of the day, I don't see much incentive to taking care of a plant for years and years and clearing a large spot for it in my home only to be rewarded with the smell of a stinking corpse at the end of the road. So the corpse flower is definitely a plant I will never own. And my guess is that almost nobody watching this will own one either. And if you do, tell us about that in the comments because I am really curious how you ended up with that. All right, so the second plant on the list that I know I will never own is the ghost orchid, AKA Dendrophylax lindenii. Now, the reason that I will never own a ghost orchid, critically endangered status aside, is that it actually requires very, very specific conditions. It only lives in swamps where the temperatures are very consistent and very stable in trees, and it's pollinated by one type of sphinx moth. The plants also have a symbiotic relationship with a fungus that is needed for them to grow and thrive, and so maybe Maybe you able to keep the orchid alive, but without the fungus, you're not going to be able to help it thrive at all. Aside from the difficult care requirements, the ghost orchid is now so rare in the wild that it's illegal to collect them. And they're so critically endangered that there's now a lot of worry that since they're only pollinated by one type of moth, even if a pollinator can find the plant when it's in bloom, the chances of it finding a second one to pollinate go down immensely. There's a lot of concern about the future of this plant in the wild. And so for that reason, it would probably be impossible to procure one through legitimate means. And even if you could, it would be extremely expensive. And then even if you could afford it, it would probably be very, very difficult to keep alive. So I just don't see the point, even if I could get the plant to trying to keep something alive that probably just doesn't want to live and that I would never probably be able to pollinate. So for me, the ghost orchid is almost assuredly a plant I will never ever own. All right, moving on. The next plant on the list is the Atropa belladonna, AKA deadly nightshade. Now, this is a plant that I will never own because it is freaking toxic and it can literally kill you and your kids and your pets. And I just don't think it's worth it. The plant is very beautiful and it has very attractive deep purple flowers, which 
I guess could have some sort of ornamental value. But considering that it is so toxic to the point where people have even gotten sick from eating honey that had too much of the atropa toxins in it from this plant, I just don't think it's worth it. I just would never want this plant to be around me anywhere. Deadly Nightshade is also well known in pop culture for toxicity. It's appeared in many, many different movies and stories as a poison. And it's just not... I just don't think it's a good idea. I feel like, you know, you keep a plant like that around, it's you're probably asking for some sort of horrible accident to happen. Not to mention that if you know anybody that drops dead because of some sort of mysterious poisoning, you're probably the first suspect on the list. So I just don't think that would ever be worth it. It's too much of a risk for me. I don't like to live that dangerously. And so the deadly nightshade plant is not something you will ever find in my collection. Next on the list is yet another orchid, and this one is called the Rothschild Slipper Orchid, aka the Gold of Kimbalu, or known as its scientific name of Pathiopetalum Rothschildianum. Now, the reason that I'll never own this orchid is that it is extremely rare, extremely endangered, and as a result, it's extremely expensive. The Rothschild Slipper Orchid is endemic to a small reserve area in Malaysia, and it only grows on the slopes of Mount Kimbalu. Additionally, the plant is extremely slow growing with reports that it can take up to 15 years for the plant to mature to the point that it can bloom. However, it is considered to be extremely beautiful and is very, very coveted and sought after. As recently as 2012, and this was the most recent legitimate source that I could find for the price on these because I think for the most part, they're probably being sold on the black market. But as recently as 2012, Rothschild Slipper orchids were going for five to six thousand dollars per stem. Imagine how much it would cost to have Rothschild slipper orchid wedding centerpieces. I mean that's something that would really only be attainable for the richest in the world and I don't know that anybody's ever attempted to do that but the plants are very very highly sought after and as a result they're very very well protected in the native country where they grow. However apparently even though the plant is extremely rare and and very slow growing. They're not actually particularly finicky or difficult to grow or to keep alive. And an experienced orchid grower, if they could get their hands on one, shouldn't really have too much trouble growing it as a house plant. However, I know that I will never own this plant because I personally am just not into orchids enough to ever attempt something that's this expensive. Plus at this point, I really don't support trying to obtain plants through, you know, illegitimate means. So perhaps eventually a grower will master a technique that allows the Rothschild slipper orchid to be grown more quickly but as of right now I don't see how I could ever own this plant given how much it costs and how rare and how coveted it is amongst the orchid community. All right, moving on, we have yet another orchid. Don't come for me. I know we don't normally talk about orchids ever on this channel, but I swear this one is probably the most interesting one. It literally blew my mind when I learned about it. Next on the list of plants I will never own is the Western Underground Orchid an underground orchid. What? <laughs> That's what I said. I was completely blown away. It completely blew my mind that there's an orchid that lives almost entirely underground and I will never own it and neither will you. The Western underground orchid or Rhizanthella gardneri is native to Western Australia and as few as 50 plants are known to be surviving in the wild. As a result, their location is absolutely a secret. You cannot find out where these plants are growing and that is to protect them from poaching. Aside from the fact that the Western underground orchid is critically endangered, the location of where they are growing is a secret, and the plant is native to Australia, which is a notoriously difficult locale to export plants from, even if I could get a hold of this plant, I don't think I could keep it alive because as I said before, it completes its entire life cycle underground. And in order to do so, it is actually a parasite site of a fungus and the fungus survives in a symbiotic relationship with the roots of a shrub. So in order to keep this orchid alive, you would have to have the conditions to not only keep the orchid alive, but also the fungus and also the shrub that are all interdependent. So I just don't see how anybody but the most diehard orchid specialist could ever hope to keep this plant alive and thriving in captivity. In keeping with the really interesting characteristics that we've already discussed, namely an orchid that lives 
lives underground that needs a fungus to survive. This plant actually has the fewest chloroplast genes of any plant that is known. And scientists are really hopeful that further study of this plant and the way that its chloroplast genes are set up could eventually lead to additional discoveries about the critical processes of essential plant functions that are not currently understood. So very, very interesting plant. It's definitely a botanical oddball and as interesting as it was to learn about, I know there's no chance that I would ever be able to own one in my own private collection, let alone keep it happy and thriving. All right, so next on the list, we have an antique bonsai. Now, most people are familiar with bonsai trees, the art of miniaturizing trees and keeping them. It's something that you see fairly frequently represented in popular culture, but the art of bonsai and the bonsai community goes way, way deeper than that. And a lot of these trees go for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. In the aeroid community, we talk about, you know, expensive plants and balk at the idea of paying a few hundred dollars for a plant. But if you think a few hundred dollars for a plant is expensive, what about tens of thousands? What about millions of dollars? That's right. I will never own a true antique bonsai simply because A, they almost never come up for sale and B, when they do, they sell for millions of dollars. Now, why are bonsai trees so expensive? Well, at the highest end of the price range, some of these trees are up to a thousand years old old. That's right. When you're looking at a plant that is a thousand years old, you definitely can't make any more of them. So thinking of an antique bonsai, it's really got to be in the same kind of vein as, you know, antique musical instruments, art, other artifacts, things that you can't make more of because they were made in the past and you can never return to that era. Officially on record, the most expensive bonsai tree ever sold was an 800 year old white pine bonsai that sold for $1.3 million at a Japanese bonsai expo, but there are reports of an unofficial sale of a juniper bonsai that was only 250 years old, but that went for $2 million. There are other trees in private collections or that are under the care of botanical institutions that will probably never be sold again, but if they were to be sold, would go for even higher than that. There is actually a bonsai ficus tree in Vietnam Nam that is reported to be worth as much as five or six million dollars, but there's very little public information about it and the owner won't even confirm how old the plant is. So it's very interesting and I think bonsai is probably one of the most incredible types of plant keeping out there. A thousand year old plant. That is just absolutely incredible and and you know I have no problem paying paying the price for quality or, or for rarity or what have you, but millions of dollars is just not not in my budget and even if it was I would have to employ a professional bonsai master to care for something like that and I just can't see ever being able to do that you know unless I win the lottery or something but then again even if I had the money these antique bonsai trees almost never come up for sale so unfortunately even though they're absolutely amazing I will probably only ever be able to see them if I'm able to visit them at botanical gardens so very 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 cool but unfortunately completely unattainable for me and also probably for you. All right, so the last plant on this list may not actually be completely unattainable for everyone. I actually saw one for sale recently and maybe, you know, for the right plant parent out there, this plant would be totally doable and uh, maybe I'm just a little bit squeamish. But the last plant on this list that I can tell you right now I will never own is the Nepenthes Raja. Now this is a very beautiful and ornate species of pitcher plant that has huge pitchers. And the reason that I will never own it is because I am just not comfortable with its diet. This this plant is so big that it actually eats mammals, reptiles, large insects, all the same reasons that I don't want a snake, <laughs> but a plant. It is a very, very cool plant and I understand why people would want to keep it, especially if you're an Apenthes specialist with your collection, but I just could never bring myself to do that. I suppose maybe if I had like an outdoor space, if I lived somewhere tropical and the plant was able to just feed itself, you know, from the natural environment and I didn't have to get involved. I suppose then maybe I would 
wouldn't mind having one, but I just can't get, you know, into that kind of diet. I actually did see some interesting research about some types of nepenthes that actually entice rats to come and lick the nectar around the top of the pitcher. And then they actually don't eat the rat. They eat the rat's excrement. They entice the rat to go to the bathroom into the pitcher and then they feed on the nitrogen and the, the nutrients from the rat droppings. Yeah, I can't do that. I can't provide that that type of environment, that level of care. I mean, I guess people do have pet rats. I could get a pet rat. Man, having to get a pet rat to feed your plant, that's a whole other level of dedication that I'm just not prepared to, uh, to deliver. So that is the last one on the list that I will never own, the Nepenthes Raja, because I just am not comfortable providing it the diet that it needs. Tell me in the comments below, are there any other plants that you don't think that you'll ever own, whether it's because they're too expensive expensive, the care requirements are off the charts, they're too big, they stink. Let me know. I'd be really, really interested to hear what you guys have to say. I love learning about new plants. Thank you so much for chilling with me and I will see you in my next one. Bye!